BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of his word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be his disciples and after his death and resurrection those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now after 2,000 years Beth Goyim Messianic congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. Let's go get a blessing. Turn to Divarim, Deuteronomy chapter 12. Divarim, Deuteronomy chapter 12, please. This is message P151. P151. This is parash number 47. Re'e, it means to see. We're going to be focusing this uh, time around in this parash teaching. Last year we did uh, chapter 11, but we're going to try to get through more of chapter 12 this year. Okay, we did uh, chapter 11 last year, and now we're going to go through a lot more of chapter 12. The whole parash is from Devarim, Deuteronomy 11, verse 26, through chapter 16, verse 17. Okay, so let's start with chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Chapter 12, verse 1. Here are the laws and rulings you are to observe and obey in the land Jehovah your Elohim of your ancestors has given you, to possess as long as you live on earth. What we have to understand is that e even though this is particular to Israel and the land, we must understand that the whole earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, okay? That we are renters, okay? Renters of his place, okay? And as a renter, you have to abide by the laws that are written in your contract. The contract that was given to us by Jehovah is his Torah, his ways. This is as tenants, we have to abide in that. Or what happens to the tenant if you don't abide in the rules given to you by your landlord? Okay, you get removed from your place of living. Okay, you don't get your security deposit back, nothing. You just have to, you get kicked out and it could be a very short notice. Same is going here and it's something that we should practice because especially once you die and you go on to the next life and there truly is a heaven you're going to be living in Jehovah's house and there's not going to be a question on what you're to do and we know from my, the end of the book of Isaiah the last chapter that in Hashemayim we're going to be doing the Rosh Kodesh and a new heaven and a new earth we're going to be doing the Rosh Kodesh and we're going to be celebrating Shabbat so here Jehovah's saying to us these are the things you're supposed to do when you get to the promised land. If you want to stay there, as long as you live on earth, you're to follow my commandments. So anybody who says that you shouldn't follow the commandments, well, they're satanic and you shouldn't follow them. They're heretics. Anybody who says uh, that you don't have to follow the laws anymore is a heretic, okay? Because in Revelation 22 verse 15, it says there, who's outside of heaven? And all you have to do is think, well, what is the definition of those words? So here, going back to chapter 12, verse 1, here are the laws and rulings you are to observe and obey in the land Jehovah your Elohim of your ancestors has given you to possess as long as you live on earth. So here, this is what you have to do. And what happened? All you have to do is read Kings and Chronicles to see what happens when we don't follow these, these rules, right? You find out, whoa, you know, you know you're, you're, the priesthood does something bad, and you, you follow them, yeah, you know, you're like a lemming. You just go right over the hill. Whee! You know, so it's, you know, you, you, we follow them. 
If you want to stay in the land, as long as you live on earth and long as you live in his land, you have to obey these. Going on to verse 2 and 3. 2 and 3. You must destroy all the places where the nation you are dispossessing serve their gods, whether on the high mountains or on hills or under the, some leafy tree. Break down their altars. Smash their standing stones to pieces. Burn up their sacred poles completely and cut down the carved images of their gods. Exterminate their name from that place. Amen? See, Jehovah knows that we're made to worship. And when you see these other things, you'll go, you'll be curious. You'll go, hey, what's that? You know, what's, you know, you see a lot of, in America, at least in our area, a lot of Italian homes. And what they have is a, a statue of Mary in the front of the house. You know, that's a, that's a God. No, tear it down. Don't have it. Don't be worshiping Mary. Do I believe Miriam, the mother of the, of the Lord, is in heaven? Yes. But can I prove it? No. Okay. So don't pray to her because she ain't hearing your prayers. There's only one that's hearing your prayers, and his name is Yeshua because, you know what? He and his daddy said they're jealous, and nobody else gets to hear your prayers. Okay. So what Jehovah is saying to us, when you go in, tear down whatever is not of me. Don't, don't leave it there. The first thing you got to do is smash them, cut them down. Now, now people say, well, we, we don't do that nowadays. Well, we should. You know, just because we don't doesn't mean we shouldn't, okay? Because we have laws in the land from pagan people, and if you broke somebody else's property, you know, you would have to you know, pay the price or go to jail or whatever. But it does not mean, see, this is where the Christian you know, who doesn't understand Jehovah. Just because we're, we haven't been doing it does not mean that we should not be doing it. Because what happens? You get drawn to it. God said, now, is God wrong? Does God not know his creation? Okay, so what he's saying is, you know, I saw what you did in the desert, remember? You know, Balaam and Balak, remember that whole thing? You know, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't get cursed. And then all of a sudden, what do they see? Oh, the nice girls dancing over there. And then what happens? Oh, the men get stupid. So the Lord is saying, cut down their stuff. Don't have it. Get rid of it. Make it a piece of trash. Throw it out. Get it out of your land. Don't do it. Because why? You will worship it. Now, it's very important to understand this because um, they, they had these Asherah poles. That's what these, these standing stones are, Asherah poles. And what Asherah poles are is a phallic symbol, okay? And what is interesting about the phall this phallic symbol, it's got a big head on the top, okay? A big the sun god, okay? That's where you get Sunday worship from this phallic symbol, okay? It's a, big, it's a face in the middle, and it's got a, like a sun. As a kid would draw, you know, in, in class, you know, they draw the little circle, and then the rays of sun coming out. That's what it looks like, Okay? It's from uh, uh, Babylonian images. It's a golden image of the sun, okay? And the thing about this, if you go to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, you will find eight of these on the altar at the top. You can uh, Google it, okay? St. Peter's Basilica, look at the picture, and you see at the top, you will see this Babylonian sun god, okay? And something, and then right on the front of the, the if you look at the front picture, you'll see this gigantic sun god, okay? And the Lord said, cut these things down. Now, this gives you understanding. See, when you're, you're looking at this and you're seeing these pictures, why hasn't it been torn down? Why is the Roman Catholic Church still having it? Because why? That plays into Revelation. So it's been there for a couple of thousand years, right? And the Lord has said, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Break down their altars. If you look at verse 3, break down their altars, smash their standing stones to pieces, Burn up their sacred poles completely and cut down the carved images of their gods. Exterminate their name from that place. You know, so then you get also into the other, the other part of it where the Catholics or people will have you know, a cross but with Yeshua on the cross. It's okay to have the cross but not to have a carved image. The cross is just two sticks. Okay, It's not a carved image. Okay, But once you put a face on it, a carved image of a person, okay? Well, that reminds me of Messiah, what he did. Uh-uh, he ain't on the cross anymore. He got down. He said, it's finished. It's done. 
They took them down. Okay, now what's so important about altars? Let's go to John chapter 2, Yochanan chapter 2, please. Verse 14 through 17. Yochanan 2, verse 14 through 17. Cut down their altars. John 2, verse 14 through 17. In the temple grounds he found those who were selling cattle, sheep, and pigeons, and others who were sitting at the tables exchanging money. He made a whip from cords and drove them all out of the temple grounds, the sheep the ca and cattle as well. He knocked over the money changers' table, scattering their coins and the pigeons, and he said, Get these things out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His Talmudine later recalled that the Tanakh says, Zeal for your house will devour me. Amen? So here in the temple, in the time of Yeshua, they had made it a marketplace. It's no place to be selling anything. I don't care if it's for the offering, whatever. Uh-uh. You don't buy or sell on the Shabbat. Period. From sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, no selling, no buying, no nothing. Okay? So here, Yeshua said, you know, he flipped over these tables. He cut, he cut them down. Okay? So you see Yeshua getting angry. Angry. You see him whipping people. You see him, you know, he really flipped out. It's like, so you can flip out for the Lord too, okay? If you're doing it in a proper understanding, just like Pincus. Remember we spoke about Pincus a couple week, weeks ago where, the, where he stuck the spear be, be, into two people in the middle of the tabernacle, okay? So, and God said what? You're a bad boy. No, he's gave him a covenant of shalom forever, okay? So Yeshua cut down the altars in his time also. Going back to Deuteronomy, Devarim 12, please. We're going to look, now look at verse 5. Twelve five. Rather, you are to come to the place where Jehovah your Elohim will put his name. He will choose it from all your tribes, and you will seek out that place, which is where he will live, and go there. Amen? So here... You're co to come to a certain place that's been set aside for God's purposes, okay? So this particular one that Jehovah is saying for this, this passage is that this would be Jerusalem, that he's going to put his name there. It doesn't mean that we can't go other places as we'll read later on in the chapter, okay? There's, it doesn't mean that you can't put up an altar. It ha we'll see later. But in this particular area, it's going to be putting his name on a certain area, on a certain object, and that name is Jehovah, okay? It's very important. Why is he doing that? He's setting that part aside. And that's what's so interesting as in Jerusalem coming under attack today. A couple of missiles got very close to the city proper of Jerusalem, at least what I read in the news today, okay? That's where God's holy city is. That is the one city we are commanded to pray for. Okay? If you look at verse 5 again, rather you are to come to the place where Jehovah your Elohim will put his name. He will choose it from all your tribes and you will seek out that place which is where he will live and go there. So here, this is very important. Remember when the, the, the tribes... Um, when Israel broke into two countries, a north and a south, and the northern kingdom put their, their uh, temple up in the city of Dan, when the temple is there, this is where we got to go, especially three times a year. Okay? Now, his name, putting his name in a certain area, a per, putting his name on a certain uh, the place, on a certain object, on a certain area. Now, why is that important to know? about the name. Turn to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 1. Revelation 14, verse 1. Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and there was a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Amen? So here, we're, we're specifically focusing on the name. Okay? So here from Divarim 12.5, it says, I'm going to put my name in a certain place. Now in Revelation, if you take that concept, 
and you broaden it a little bit to in the end, he's putting his name on a certain group of people and this 144,000 are going to be doing a certain, for, uh, a certain job. But it's very important to see something here that's vital because it isn't everybody. One, the 144,000 is listed in Revelation 7. But here, that 144,000, if you look closely at verse 1, the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name. Amen? So what does that mean? His name, that means they are messianic believers. His father's name means that they're from the bloodline of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So that doesn't mean the Gentiles could get 144,000 believers around. So this puts the Jehovah Witnesses right out the window and their silliness and their, their, their very poor theology because they don't have the bloodline, okay? They also don't do Sabbath, okay? So you know that they're not his, okay? But here, his name, his place, there will be a certain place that will bring him back, okay? But here, what I want you to see is the correlation of him putting a name on a certain grouping of people, certain grouping of people, certain place where he's going to live, where he said he will live, okay? So here in the end of days, it's 140,000, 144,000 virgin Jewish men. Okay, let's go back to Devarim uh, chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. 6 and 7. Devarim 12, verse 6 and 7. You will bring there your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tenths. The offerings that you give, the offerings that you have vowed, your voluntary offerings, and the firstborn of your cattle and sheep. There you will eat in the presence of Jehovah your Elohim, and you will rejoice in everything you set out to do. And uh, you, you and your household in which Jehovah your Elohim has blessed you. Amen? So this starts from the beginning. Remember in the beginning of the chapter we spoke about following what the landlord wants you to do. Okay? You live there. You can live there rent-free. God is saying, live here in my house rent-free. Just follow what I tell you to do. And all you got to do is give me 10% of what you bring in. Okay? And I'm the one who's bringing the rain, so I'm the one who's going to bless your crops. I'm the one who's going to bring the sun. I'm the one who's going to, you know, because who can make a baby except the Lord? And you know, there's so many people who've gone through in vitro fertilization. It doesn't take. Well, it's supposed to take. Well, I did everything right. Well, why didn't it work? Well, because God said so. Okay? So here, you will bring this tithe in, this 10% set aside, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your vows, your voluntary offerings. See, the, what also you want to understand is look at all the offerings. Okay? This is when you're witnessing to a, a Sunday worshiping Christian who doesn't know anything about uh, the Bible, and you say, they say to you, well, Jesus did everything. He did. Well, if you read Rav Shoal's writings, you know, because that's what they'll quote all the time, what do they say? It's a sin offering. Yeshua became the sin offering. Wait, let's just take a look in verse 6. How many offerings? We got a burnt offering, okay, sacrifice offering, okay, a vow offering, and a voluntary offering. So is Yeshua any one of those? No. There's other ones that he didn't desire to do. He became the sin offering. The sin offering because why? We have a death sentence on us. And as we've learned in the past, if the price is paid because you had a death sentence by somebody else, you get to live. But it doesn't mean that you don't then give Jehovah a thank offering. It doesn't mean that you don't give voluntary offerings. You know, he's blessing you. You should bring in the tithe offering. Why? Because if you're learning about the Lord, you know, from somebody who's teaching you, a rabbi, a messianic pastor, you should bless them because they're the ones that are teaching you. You went to college, right, or you went to high school. Did you think the teacher worked there for free? Okay. Somebody got a salary. So the salary that the litbaim, the kohenim, the rabbis today, the messianic rabbis, the messianic pastors, you know, you should offer up. You should give your tithes and offerings because you know what? Jehovah's watching you. 
And if you don't, don't worry. He's a Jewish accountant. He'll take it away from you. And that's what he's about to do to the world because we have not been giving what we're supposed to be giving. If you don't give now, don't worry. It's going to be a lot worse later on. Now, why is that important, this concept of giving and this concept of bringing it to God's place? Turn into Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, please. Matthew 26, please. Verse 29. Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verse 29. I tell you, I will not drink of this, I will not drink this fruit of the vine again until the day I drink new wine with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen? So if you're the ones that are going to be giving the offering and you get into Jehovah's house, what do you get to drink? You get to drink that new wine. But if you've been holding out on him, well, you know, I, I, if I give my tenth and tithe and offering, uh, I don't have enough to live on. Well, you're not trusting in Jehovah, are you? But if you hold back, don't worry. When you get, don't you want a full cup? You know, don't you want a, you know, a glass of wine like you know, this big when you get to heaven? You know? But if you hold back on him, don't worry. He knows how to keep score. Okay, what we have to do is take care of our congregations. The place where you are, wherever you're listening, don't just sit back, tithe and offering, because Yeshua said, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to drink this wine again until I drink it again anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay, go back to Devarim 12 again. Verse 8, we're cooking with gas. We've gotten through eight verses. Devarim 12, Deuteronomy 12, verse 8. Devarim 12, verse 8. You will not do things the way we do them here today, where everyone does whatever his own opinion seems right. Amen? This is, a, this is an amazing scripture. When you get to the promised land, you're not going to do it the way you want to do it, Jehovah's saying. What he is saying here. Because your opinion doesn't matter. Okay? When you come to my house, you're going to do things my way. This is, uh, you know, what I've been hearing lately a lot is, um, you know, the Gentiles don't have to follow the Torah. Well, then God's a liar right here. Because, you know, your opinion doesn't matter. God says, this is what I want done and how I want it done. Period. Your opinion means nothing to me. It's like, you know, a two-year-old trying to tell you how to drive the car. You know, your opinion means a paramount disinterest to me. Okay? So here, look at that verse, and you may want to underline it. You will not do things the way we do them here today, where everyone does whatever is in his own opinion seems right. That's what the church is today. And unfortunately, sadly enough, a lot of Messianic congregations. You should do what the Bible teaches. Cite the moon. You know, we're coming, into the, we're coming to the end of the fifth month. How do we cite the moon? Well, cite the moon. Black, it turns black. And then the first thing we see, that must be the Rosh Kodesh. Real simple. Banana. Remember, banana. Okay? All right? So don't do what you, you want. You want to get into Jehovah's house. That's why this chapter is important. What does it start out with? If you do these things until you die... You'll, you'll live long in the land. What did it say in verse 1? What did it say in verse 1? What did it say there in verse 1? It's very important. Here are the laws and rulings you are to observe and obey in the land. Jehovah your Elohim, your God of your ancestors, is, has given you to possess as long as you live on earth. Do them the way he wants and you'll live long. You'll be prosperous. You'll have enough rain. All these wonderful things will happen. But if you don't want to follow in his ways, if you don't want to follow, we're not going to do it the way you seem right. Now, why is that important? Turn to Proverbs 18. Proverbs, the book of Mishlai, chapter 18, verse 2. Proverbs, chapter 18, 
verse 2. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2. A fool takes no pleasure in trying to understand. He only wants to express his own opinion. Let's say that again for those that are tired. 18 verse 2. A fool takes no pleasure in trying to understand. He only wants to express his own opinion. So if somebody says to you, you don't have to keep kosher anymore, they're satanic. They were expressing their own opinion. And if they say, you know, well, it's not in the New Testament. It doesn't have to be there because God doesn't change. Okay? Really, that particular simple. Okay? Yeshua didn't put it away. Not one jot or tittle will be missing. How hard is that to understand? Okay? So a fool takes no pleasure in trying to understand. He only wants to have his own opinion. Oh, that ties right together with what it said in Deuteronomy 12, verse 8. God doesn't care about your opinion. And if, you, if you, you're trying to express your opinion in him, he says what? You're a fool. That's not a compliment. You know, okay, now let's, let's take that a little further. Let's take that a little further. T take it to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 to 29. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 29. Ephesians, let's take this opinion a little further. Let's see what God's opinion is in the Brit Hadashah or the New Testament for those people. Therefore, stripping off all falsehood, let everyone speak truth with his neighbor because we are intimate related to each other as parts of a body. Be angry. What? But don't sin. Don't let the sun go down before you have dealt with the cause of your anger. Otherwise, you leave room for the adversary. The thief must stop stealing. Instead, he should make an honest living by his own efforts. This way... You'll be able to share with those in need. Let no harmful language come from your mouth. Only good words that are helpful in meeting the need. Words that benefit those who hear them. Amen? So here we come to the, to the part where, well, when you tell somebody they're doing wrong, well, you're judging me. No, I'm being helpful to you because if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to end up in hell. Okay? So in love, okay, be honest. Not my opinion, what God's opinion. Okay? Don't look at that woman. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't eat the pig. Okay? But here, look at verse 26. Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down before you have dealt with the cause of your anger. Paul is saying you could be angry. Be angry. Whoa! What are we going to be angry about? not following God's word in the congregation. All right, let's take it a little further. Got a few more minutes here. Let's see here. Let's take it down to the end of the chapter a little bit. Uh, let's go to verse 15. Deuteronomy 12, verse 15. Deuteronomy 12, verse 15. However, you may slaughter and eat meat wherever you live, and whenever you want, in keeping with the degree to which Jehovah your Elohim has blessed you, the unclean and the clean may eat it as if it were gazelle or deer. Okay? Now, there's a, if you read it fast, you don't understand what's saying there. Okay? Some people say, see, we can eat whatever we want. God is making everything clean. No. The unclean and clean may eat it. Okay? The food's not eating itself. Oh, I've seen my dog, you know, gnaw on his foot a little bit, but he was cleaning it, okay? You know, I've seen some dogs chase their tail and bite their own tail, but they're not eating it. And then when they bite it, they, they yelp. It's like, well, you just bit your own tail, you dingbat, okay? The unclean and the clean may eat it, okay? It's not talking about the food. They're not Jehovah's not changing the kosher laws because, look, when you look earlier in the verse, keeping with the degree to which Jehovah your Elohim has blessed you. What degree is that? Well, Leviticus 11 tells us what we can eat and can't eat. Okay? And the gazelle and deer we can eat. Okay? I've had deer. I haven't had gazelle. I don't know what it tastes like. Probably tastes like chicken. Okay. That's what they say about everything. Okay? Uh, let's move down a little bit more in the chapter. Uh, verse 19. Verse 19. Deverine 12, verse 19. Shalom. This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. 
I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to The Remnant's Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, BethGoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, BethGoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnants Call. As long as you are living on your property, take care not to abandon the Levi. Amen? So this is what we were talking about earlier, about taking care of your teachers, your rabbis, your pastors, the ones that are taking care of you spiritually, teaching you the laws. We can't, you really just can't read the Bible and understand it fully. As we see from Ezra and Nehemiah, you know, when he says, oh, you're doing Passover all wrong. Good hard effort, but you're doing it wrong. So let the scribe, the teacher, the rabbi teach you. Okay? So you're living on your property. You should be tithing. So if you're not a farmer, well, what is your tithe? Well, that would be 10% of your income. You don't want to? Well, that's cool. Don't worry. God's an accountant. And he's Jewish, too. Okay? So take care of your rabbis, your teachers, and your, your, your pastors. Well, let's take this one last verse a little longer. Let's see if that carries on to the New Testament. Turn to one of my favorite chapters in the book of Acts, chapter 5. Chapter 5 of the book of Acts. Now, this is clear that the law is still in effect. Okay? Anybody who says the law is not in effect, just read Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and uh, you're going to find out. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Hecho cinco versículo uno al once. Ah, sounded like I knew what I was saying. But there was a man named Hananiah who, with his wife, Shapira, sold some property, and with his wife's knowledge, withheld some of the proceeds for himself, although he did bring the rest of, to the emissaries. Then Kepha said, Why has the adversary so filled your heart that you lied to the Ruach HaKodesh and keep back some of the money you received for the land? Before you sold it, the property was yours, and after you sold it, the money was yours to use as you please. So what made you decide to do such a thing? You have lied not to human beings, but to God. On hearing these words, Hananiah fell down dead. Boom. And everyone who heard about it was terrified. The young men got up, wrapped his body in a shroud, carried him and buried him. Buried him. Some three hours later, his, his wife came in, unaware of what had happened. Kept a challenge her. Tell me, is it true that you sold the land for such and such a price? Yes, she answered. This is what we paid. This is, is what we were paid for it. But Kepha came back to her. And why did, the, did you people plot to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the men who buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out too. Instantly she clapped at his feet and died. The young men entered, found her, her there dead and said, man, I've got to bury somebody else. Carried her out and buried her beside her husband. As a result of this, great fear came over the whole Messianic community and indeed in every, over everyone who had heard about it. So, if you want to keep withholding your tithes and offerings to the places where you're worshiping, or the one that's giving you this message, if you're online with us, beyond the prayer tower, or Beth Yeshua there, don't worry. The Lord is still in charge. And in the New Testament, see, lying gets you death. Holding back gets you death, okay? Because if you say you're supposed to do something, as so long as you're living on this property, you're coming there to get spiritually fed, then the lights and electricity... The food, everything costs money, guys. Take care of the place that you're worshiping, or don't worry. Learn it from the Jewish people. You don't take care of God's house, and you don't do it the way you're supposed to, he'll take his house away from you. And then when that happens, then the enemy comes in like a flood. All right, we've gone over our time for today. It's been wonderful talking to you about Jehovah's Word. Amen. And amen. 
Shalom, this is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to The Remnant's Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M dot org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnant's Call. If you have not taken your first steps to be born again, just ask God's help. Remember, it's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us, and He's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let Him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman, and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles, living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. Beth Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture, truly the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend the day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially news from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures, searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our King's Word. We close this Shabbat together with the reading of the New Week's Parashah. That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and biblical Holy Day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics. 
including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the Tri-State area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. Our phone number is 973-338-7800 or 978-2-YESHUA. That's 978, the number 2, YESHUA. Shalom.